I wanted to talk about um, relative versus absolute difficulty, and um, I don't have a handout for you. Uh, I almost had a handout for you. Uh, the almost was that my plan was I was going to bring you a poem in Russian uh, and <laughs> hand it out and see how many of you had difficulty with it uh, and, and how many of you didn't. Uh, and that would have been a fun illustration, but we can just sort of keep it as a mental exercise. I've, um, I started thinking about the notion of absolute difficulty, uh, which I'll explain momentarily, uh, about a year, year and a half ago when I did something very ill-advised. Uh, there is a, a video game called Halo, a uh, very popular video game for the Xbox and Xbox 360 home entertainment things. Um, this is a plotted game, a game that is actually designed by movie producers so that you move through a certain plot. That's basically how I've played those games in the past, and I don't want you to think that this is how I spend my time. This is only how I wish to spend my time. I don't actually get to play these things but maybe six hours a year. Uh, but the ill-advised thing I did was to use the game in the manner that is most popular. Um, which is not to follow the plot of the game from one level to the next or one task to the next, which involves puzzle solving and, um, and a, a certain kind of narrative uh, acuity. Uh, instead, I did what everyone else apparently does, which is to jump into what is called competitive play, where you combat uh, in a first-person shooting environment against 12 year old boys all <laughs> over the world. <laughs> and in doing so, you choose your skill level because you don't want to jump in to the most advanced room. Uh, I chose the, essentially the kindergarten room. <laughs> and I think the first time I got killed, it took about four and a half seconds. Like, you know, the game starts, I'm dead. <laughs> and then you, and then the little clock starts up, and the clock counts down, and then you, and, and then you, uh, there's a great term, you respawn, um, which is which is something I'm hoping to bring into the real world in some way. But you you respawn, and then you play again. I would my character would respawn, three seconds dead, and I was at the very lowest skill level. There was no place for me to go. From that moment on, I try, and I kept at it for about 45 minutes before I quit. I'd never, I don't think I ever killed anybody else. All these 12 year old boys giggling around the world killing uh, a professor at the University of Michigan. And it occurred to me that this is something I simply am not going to be very good at, uh, at least not without a great deal of practice. This is a different quality of difficulty from, say, the difficulty of eating really spicy Thai food, where you get to choose mild, medium, hot, <laughs> or Thai, probably, it's just the, you know, the highest level, where the heat uh, of that food is actually quantifiable. And some people may like it, some people may not, but you know what you're getting when you make your order. That is something more along the lines of absolute difficulty. And that's actually the idea of difficulty, I would argue, that we have in, uh, still with us in contemporary American poetry. And I happen to bring a book that's a fairly recent book by, by uh, the poet and theorist Charles Bernstein, Attack of the Difficult Poems. And he argues um, early in the book that in fact difficulty is an absolute value, that there are some poems that are just difficult poems. Uh, and what he, what he also argues is that the, the key to reading them is recognizing that it's not your fault. Uh, but this idea of the poem having an absolute level of difficulty, and this is, I, as I, I just said, I think this is, very, this is an idea very much with us today and is at the heart of some of the debates I see among poetry or literary communities, uh, those who favor, say, the post-confessional narrative lyric uh, versus a language poem or something like this. Uh, it's also at the heart of debates I see or antagonisms between the academy and uh, literary publishing, uh, where many poets who consider themselves, who are often very full of themselves for how much they read and how invested they are in literature, nevertheless deride 
so-called academic criticism as being too difficult, too detached from uh, poetry. But this idea has a history, and the history uh, uh, is perhaps most um, visible in exactly the period that uh, John was just talking about. Uh, when we look at Anglo-American modernism, we find uh, a, uh, a sudden turn in artistic representation toward bafflement, things that are just really hard to relate to. And uh, a couple of uh, scholars of modernism whom I like a great deal, Thomas uh, Vargas and, and Dela Mook, uh, have, a, have a, I think, a very productive term for this. They call this epistemic trauma. Uh, and the reason it's a productive term is that it doesn't apply strictly to literature. This to them, to, to, to Mook and, and Vargas, is a symptom of modernism. That if you were, whether you're looking at Picasso's uh, Demoiselle d'Avignon, or you're listening to Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, or you are trying to understand what the hell these newspapers are talking about when they're talking about Einstein and relativity theory, uh, Einstein being one of the major global celebrities of the 1920s, and relativity theory was discussed widely by journalists who didn't understand it. Whether you're talking about physics, literature, music, art, uh, politics, for that matter, one of the common symptoms of modernism and of what we call modernism is what uh, uh, um, Mook and Vargas refer to as this epistemic trauma, this I don't get it moment. Uh, this is something that is to be used, according to uh, these artists and theorists, not simply as a tool of bafflement, but as a tool of accessing reality as it actually is. Einstein was not looking to confuse us, he was looking strictly to describe what he uh, was um, perceiving in, in the world around us. Uh, likewise, Picasso was not looking simply to baffle us, but he was looking to represent a kind of perception that gets edited out of realist painting. Uh, so these people in various uh, fields are actually not trying to make life difficult for us, they're simply trying to reflect reality as they perceive it. Uh, this itself has its own prehistory, where we can talk about romantic literature, for example, which baffled a great many people in its time, but we don't have as much difficulty with it now. Um, we can talk about poetry, uh, pure poetry, poésie pure, uh, and the idea that language that refers to itself is is less deceptive than language that purports to represent a universally accessible reality. Uh, these are things that have been on my mind because, uh, it, because it's rather shocking to me the extent to which this idea of an absolute difficulty remains with us. And as far as I know, Doug's going to go on and talk about how some of these poems we find really difficult now were not particularly difficult in their time, or not necessarily perceived as being difficult in their time, but uh, that, um, that horizon of expectations will change, and, and some things that were once difficult will become easy or, or the other way around. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention, though, is that it is in the period, the early period of what we call modernism, that difficulty becomes formulated not only as an absolute value, but as a tool as something that actually affects, in a positive way, our approach to poetry or to any artistic representation by pushing us out of the text. Uh, one of the um, theorists I've uh, worked on just a little bit on this is Ernest Fenollosa, who is also uh, a great influence on Pound. Uh, Fenollosa, whom some of you may know, but uh, anyone who actually studies East Asian languages uh, or cultures uh, probably reviles this man. Uh, nevertheless, he is a, uh, he's certainly influential on Anglo-American modernists because he posits uh, uh, notions about Chinese characters, uh, that is written characters, uh, as representational art in themselves that resist immediate comprehension. 
Pound takes up this idea, and of course we're reading an English poem and suddenly we see a Chinese character in there and we don't know what to do with it. It would be a very similar experience for, uh, uh, to, uh, to that if I were to give you all a handout with a Russian poem and you would just kind of look at it, baffled. But there are ways in which to make that text more accessible, less difficult. Uh, for example, you could learn Russian. Um, I, people laugh when I say that. I learned Russian. It's, 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 it, it can be done. Uh, you could translate the text. You could gloss the text. You could do any number. You could ask someone else to interpret it for you. There are ways of making these things a lot less difficult if you choose to put the time into it. But it's also worthwhile to see these forms of difficulty, these resistances of the text, as meaningful in themselves as long as we're comfortable with being uncomfortable. That's all I have to say. Super. <laughs>